Hi, I'm Christian Geldmacher from the Fiori Makers, the learning community around SAP Fiori design. In this video, we will present to you the Fiori Makers showcase from our partner 2BM. August N. Kilde, digital team lead at 2BM, will present to you their Fiori project that they have done together with their customer Scoff. And together with me, I have Kai Richter, chief designer of SAP Fiori Design. And after August has introduced you to the SCOF project, Kai will present this showcase from a Fiori Design Guidelines perspective. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, I hand over to August. August, maybe you start introducing yourself. Hello, my name is August Enkilde. I'm uh, from a company called 2BM, and we are placed here in Denmark, where we are right now. Uh, 2BM is a partner company to SAP, and that means that we are helping a lot of very large companies in Denmark uh, with their SAP systems, and we help them to uh, make nice applications on top of the foundation of the SAP system they have. And of course, for that, uh, we use uh, the tools that we have, uh, that SAP has made, which is called uh, Fiori and UI5, and um, which is a HTML tool to build web application, hybrid application, so on. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, but before I do that, I just want to tell that uh, our company, of course, are doing more than just front-end applications. We also work to help companies uh, with the general ERP system, with the HR system, with success factor, and, and, uh, and compliance. These days, compliance is, of course, a very big word because uh, all of this uh, uh, privacy things coming up with all new rules, and we also, of course, help with that. But for now, we will talk about this case uh, for a company we did. Uh, actually, it's more than a year ago, almost one and a half year ago, we started this project uh, with a company called Sko in the north part of Denmark, in Jutland. And Sko, uh, we will now look into what they are working on. The application we did for Sko is an application for the field service workers. And that means uh, SCO is an, uh, that's, uh, for some people who has to go out in the field and do some work, some maintenance or some repair stuff at uh, some places. And what places they are, we will show here. I already mentioned that this UI5 application means we are using the Fiori framework to design the applications and make the applications. Uh, SCO is a, a company that is making um, um, climate systems for big pigs and chicken farms. And they do not only do it in Denmark, but they do it all over the world. And of course, in, in China and Arabic countries, there's very big chicken farms. And this kind of farms, if you just have a slight uh, error in the climate system, uh, you could have millions of chickens dying in, in within hours. So of course it's extremely important that the whole monitoring, that the system is working uh, with the climate and that you can go out and fastly repair if anything is wrong and check that all the alarm is, is working. And that's what those field service workers are doing. They, they get work orders to go out and do work and, and make sure the climate systems are working. And beforehand, that was uh, done uh, in other systems and some part of it was done in Excel. And, and it, generally, it was not uh, so tightly connected to the sub backend as they would like to. So, of course, uh, that was a whole target uh, to, to make an application that they can easily bring out uh, in the field and work on from their mobile device and make sure that all information is brought back to the subsystem as, as they work. Another very important thing about the system is that when you go out and work in a farm, uh, the farm is quite often surrounded by a lot of metal. That means that the, the, even though you have a 3G or 4G or in the future 5G connection uh, with your mobile device, there's not always internet connection inside the farms. And therefore we fastly discovered that we need to make the application work offline. That means that they can actually download all the work orders and they can go out and do the work and when, 
whenever there's internet again, uh, it will be automatically uploaded and synchronized to the backend. So um, uh, the farm here, we just see a slide where you actually just see an idea of what they are actually producing. They're producing all the ventilations and the climate systems. And around all this, there's of course a lot of sensors and alarms controlling that everything is running as it should. Uh, SCOR themselves has done a lot of IoT work as well, and some of that tells them when to go and do work orders. To start such a process to finding out what is actually needed in this kind of applications, we, knew we use a, a design uh, methodology called design thinking, and uh, design thinking is in short term set, it's a way where you put the end user, the one who is going to use the application, in centrum of your whole process of of uh, designing the application. That means we go out in the field. Uh, first of all, I'll just say you see the design thinking can be different phases that you go through in the framework when, uh, or in, the, in this setup. And it can be different depending on the story or the situation. Sometimes you really need to explore what is actually the problem. Sometimes you already know the problem, but I have to explore, okay, but how do we need to solve it in the situation where you are out there in the, in the farm? What kind of device? Do you have a mobile device or do you bring a computer? All these kind of things you have to figure out. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and that's going through different phases. I will not go completely into details with that. But uh, uh, as you see on the slides, there's an emphasize phase, there's a definition phase, there's this uh, ideation phase. And the prototype phase, which is very important because that's where we do the mock-ups and we kind of discover if we have done errors in the application before we actually develop the application and then we can go back and correct it and, and continue until we have the mock-ups that is really the starting point of developing the application. And of course, the testing is very important as well in the end. So based on two design thinking workshops actually uh, and a lot of mock-ups and iterations, the app was built in a, in a Scrum project uh, way. That means that we control the whole project uh, using the Scrum uh, project. And, and, and the nice thing about Scrum is that uh, we can divide the whole development in, in small phases and make sure that uh, when each phase or each sprint is over, we can actually test it and make sure now this works and we can move on to the next sprint uh, part of the development. We used different uh, mock-up tools for this um, thing. In the beginning, we used Balsamico, which is a tool where you can make some very rough mock-ups that is not looking like any sub-applications or anything, but it can give you a fast tool to give you an idea of, okay, what kind of buttons or views do we need in the applications. For that, you can actually also just use pen if you're good at drawing with a pen and paper. Uh, but you can also use tools like Batsamico. Later on, we move to Axure. Axure is a, a, a nice designing tool, uh, software that you can use that has uh, Fiori and SAP uh, elements built in so that you can actually say, okay, I need a calendar dropdown. Then you can actually bring in a calendar dropdown that looks exactly the same as the one you will build in the end when you actually build the Fiori design application, design application in the end. So that means you have a lot of uh, pre, uh, pre built uh, elements you can bring in. And that's very good because in, by that, by using this kind of tools, you actually make a more one to one mockup that looks exactly, more or less exactly, the mockup will look exactly like the end product will look. Uh, and that means when then the, the users is going to test it, they say, ah, but it looks like what we talked about it should look and not like almost like we talked about. And that's, uh, that makes the whole process much more easy to get into the testing and actually discovering if something was missing from the old mockups because that can be difficult if they look very different, the mockups, compared to the final product. Here you see some pictures from the session because uh, using the design thinking, it's very important to actually go out and, and, and do some exploration in the field and you shadow the end user, see what they're doing. Here we're inside the car of the field service workers. You see, okay, how, how, how is his system about his material? Does he control stock of material in the car or is it just random he picks out and then he counts later? All these kind of things is very important to know about if you want to, for instance, uh, keep track of stock and make sure that the 
people working home in the back office, they can order material that you maybe need or running out of stock in your car. Uh, later, you see uh, during the session also we, we bring these two guys, people you see here, you see one from the uh, one from uh, out of the right side. Um, he's actually also a field service worker that is in the session where we talk about uh, the needs and the personas and 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 all the thoughts that could be about the application. So in the process, we, we, we get up a lot of ideas, as you see uh, here on the, on the lower picture. And, and, and from that one, we choose the best, of course. And we, of course, uh, merge it all together into, uh, into the mock-ups and, and the definition of the application. We talked about personas. And uh, we have three kind of personas. We have the customer, who is the one that we actually go and help, the guy who owns the farm that's calling and say, hey, I have a problem, and we call the, the field service worker, which is, of course, one persona. But another important persona is the di dispatcher. That's the, the guy who is sitting back home in the office and actually dispatching the work orders. He's taking the phone when the farmer is calling and say, hey, I have a problem. Can you send a man? So uh, this kind of, they have, of course, different needs uh, and uh, different roles here. And of course, the most often, uh, important in the end is that the customer is happy because uh, that's what they make the, uh, earn their money from. We talked already about offline. And uh, as I said, it has to be able to work offline. Otherwise, there can be situations where they cannot go and do the work because they cannot open the application if they do not have internet. Uh, and, and in this case, we need to handle the, the, the information about the materials, the time they spend, uh, the photos they take, uh, some reports, and also checklists because they have to go out. And when they go there and do a service, they have to do some routine check. They have to check that the batteries are in place in the alarms and so on. And that is a checklist we built for that. Here you see some of uh, the basic mock-ups we did in Balsamico in the beginning. That was during the first uh, session we had. And there we came up with different ideas of what do we actually need, what would be nice to have. In, 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 and uh, you see something about a camera that we need to be able to take a picture, a, an idea of getting the uh, direction of how to drive to the place, information of the, co of the customer, and of course, what should be done, the task description, and so on. Uh, later, we went to Axure, and, and what you see here is actually uh, the, t the design we did in Axure that is pretty similar to what it ended up look like, the application, in the end. And from the time we went to Axure, also it, it became much more easy to start to really get the details about the, the, the needs in the application, because then we could really say, okay, but you, you, you have to sign off. Is this what you need in the app? And in that way, the customer is also more committed to, to decide what should be in the app. Uh, the application itself, I will just get into now showing the application. Before that, I will just show the use path in the application, we have what we call a launch pad. The launch pad is a place where you have some different tiles. A tile is like on your mobile phone, you have different small squares you click on that opens an application. In the same way, inside the, the, the this application, you have some different smaller application inside the application you can open. From there on, you can open a list of work orders. From the list of work orders, you can go to the detail of the work order. We also have something about goods received, if they receive new material to the car, and we have some time registration. But for today, we will focus on the top part, the blue part of the work order. Uh, the whole setup of, the, of this system that we built, since it has to work offline, it was very obvious for us that we should use the SAP cloud platform, because uh, by do using this, we will have a lot of features uh, for free in the way of uh, uh, this whole offline uh, enablement, because the sub platform enables us to actually keep track of synchronization of the of the record, the work orders uh, to the device and from the device, and make sure that it collects and knows what is on the device and what should be synced back and forth and so on when we work offline and go back to online. So we actually connect to an on-premise standard gateway. The gateway has a cloud connector that connects to the cloud system where we handle the offline control synchronization and that goes out to the, appli the application itself. The application is what we call a hybrid application. A hybrid application is a SAP UI5 
build application, but we pack it into a, a native shell. That means that we can actually put it on the App Store and, and they can download it from there if they want. In this case, they have their own MDM tool they use to distribute out the application. But the nice thing about using this UI5 framework is that we can actually have this native kind of feel of application. At the same time, they can also have a web link there where they can connect to the application. And that means they can actually connect to the work orders in different ways, depending on if they are sitting behind a desktop or if they are in the mobile device with an application. And that will, because of this nice Fiori framework and the, 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 the possibilities with the UI5, it will be responsive. That means that uh, if you open on a mobile device, it will fit into the mobile screen and you will not see a lot of small letters, but the letters will actually be re nice and easily readable in the screen. And if it's on the desktop, it will expand and give you some other possibilities. Here we see the launch pad. And uh, uh, you see there's you know, those three tiles we talked about going into the work orders. You see how many work orders are. You see the time registration and the goods received. Uh, the nice thing about using this as a start point of the application is that if you think it as different models we can attach. In the beginning we just had the work orders and now we attach the time registration goods received and we are in dialogue with Go about other things that could be added and it's just adding a new tile and of course then connected to the application we will build in the backend uh, for that tile. The application has, the work order application has a work list that we start out with. The work list is a simple uh, table list view uh, where you see some information, you see if there's a priority, there's something about a status, about a starting time of when it should start the work, the name of the person where we go, uh, the CHR is something about tag of the location where you're going and then there's address and the description and this is of course there could be a lot of other things that could be in the list but it's uh, of course chosen by dialogue with the with the end users say talking to them and say okay what do you really need to see in this list and we only have what he's exactly needs on the list and nothing else um, this status is interesting because the status tells something about if you have been to, because if you've been to a pig farm and go to a chicken farm and it could be this pig farm has some infected animals then you're not allowed to go to a chicken farm and, and back and forth and, 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 and that tells some status about if you should be aware of these things and where you can go next. Uh, so that's of course a pretty important status when you decide what order you want to take your orders. Go. Uh, up in the top it says test system, it's because it's a test system right now. Um, and then you can see some information if you click about uh, how, if there was any errors in any kind of synchronization. Normally it goes very fluid, but it could be smaller problems that you can see there and, and get information if you need to make sure you're online to resync again, what could happen. For the detail page, we use a Fiori element called object page. An object page is a page where you, in a way, have different tabs in the top or clickable links and depending on where you click you will scroll down the page. It's a very, it can be a very endless long page actually and when you click on this general or description or materials or comments you will actually just scroll down to that section of the page. So in a way it's kind of a tab but you have the whole tab expanded to the whole page and you just scroll to it. The nice thing about this is when you stand with a, an iPad or another kind of tablet, it feels very natural just to scroll up and down and look on your order and you have everything in one page. Uh, and, and we like that and, uh, and our customer like that as well. Uh, in the top you have some, what we identify as most important information he needs to know. Uh, and, and, and that's a, again some of the things is what we also saw in the list view. Uh, you see that uh, this um, work address is blue and it's actually clickable and when you click it will open uh, uh, the built-in map system you have on your device and give you a route there. Um, let's go further. You see we have a, a, an area of this scrollable page called general, then we have the description, we have materials, comments, attachments, time and travel where you report in how much time you spend and the checklist. <coughs> materials is what you, s you spend of materials when you are working 
and you can add materials. You can also scan if you took up a material with a, st a scan code and you can use a built-in scanner uh, to scan and then automatically register what material you use. Uh, but you can also go further and click the plus and you will be brought into a page where you actually add material. You have a search field and, and when you find what you need you can put in uh, how many you used how many material you used, but you can also put in a discount price because uh, in this spe specific case they are actually allowed to give a certain amount of discount in some certain circumstances and then they put in what discount they got. Um, and you see when you search in the lower right part here you see what then when you search you get a, a list of, of materials depending on, on your search criteria. Uh, materials will come back and you will see the material with, with pictures if you have pictures in the back end. And here you also in this slide you also see the scanning that if you click the scan you can actually scan the material and, and find the material automatically. And that's because we use this hybrid application framework because when we use that we can actually use the camera in the device to do the scanning. Comments. The only thing I want to say comments because it's basically just two comment fields where you can write comments but it's important because one thing is what they have to put into their SAP system but another thing is what they want to put on a report to the customer and sometimes you want to put some comments on the report and some comments for your internal comments and here they can choose to put comments that will be on the, the, on the report and comments that is for internal uh, here. Uh, I will try to go to the next slide. Time and travel, we tried to make it very easy for them to, to put in time and travel um, because they actually just have four uh, PSPs they use and uh, it's always the same so we can make a static page where they actually uh, always have those four areas where they could put in so it's just four fields they have to put in and it's very straightforward. What did you use for transportation time? What did you use for uh, time to for the work you did. Was it a guarantee operation for the driving or was it guarantee uh, work you did? Uh, because sometimes it's guarantee and sometimes it's uh, you know invoiceable hours they, they spend. Um, uh, now uh, uh, we, they had the customer had a specific need of this checklist as I said. They have to go and check certain stuff every time they are there and there's many ways to do checklists and to do uh, inspection rounds in, in, in SAP uh, and the customer did not use uh, the usual way you do it so we ended up uh, creating a custom solution for them where they can actually create their own checklist in the background in, in the back end and based on that checklist that they can assign the checklist to the user so when they make a work order, you see here, we, we, they can put in the number. They can have templates of checklists, and depending on what the tech template numbers they put in, this checklist will then be available in the, in the application uh, for that specific work order. And here you see that the, there is assigned two checklists, and they can also go themselves and click to assign more checklists to the work order if they discover that they need another checklist as well. So that's predefined checks they should do in certain areas. Uh, the checklist itself uh, is, is dynamic, dynamically built. <laughs> that means that uh, if, that when you, uh, it's not depending on what they get from the work order of template, it will be built in the front end. So that means we don't have to rebuild the front end if they decide to have another checklist, which is of course nice for them. They can just set it up themselves. Uh, but it's a little tricky to build this kind of dynamic check checklist and we decided to do in a list view and, uh, and so that uh, it's, it's listed up here because that could fulfill their needs but in some circumstances we would be need to do it in other ways of course. Uh, within the checklist there's also some drop downs that we, they can define and, and so on to make the input as easy as possible if there's only four things to choose between. Here you see the checklist input types, but because we define different types of what they could actually put into the checklist. They can put a checklist uh, entity and then they can define the type and if it should be uh, something that uh, should be validated or not and, and, and so on. And then here you see some of the different types. You can put in photo, you can, uh, you can put in of course a normal checklist, you can put the drop down and, and, and the calendar input. 
uh, and normal remark fields and so on. And of course, if some of the fields are uh, mandatory, uh, you will get a prompt saying that you, you, you need to fulfill uh, the checklist before you can go on. This was actually the end of my presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, I hope you will maybe make some comments on this blog. Uh, and maybe uh, Kai, who will review this and look forward to hear Kai's review of, of this, uh, maybe he will also already answer some of the questions that you have. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, look forward to see you another time. Oh, thank you, August. And I think that was a great project. I especially liked how you did the research and the needs finding and how you then iterated the design until you met the needs of the users. So Kai, what do you say about the Fury design? Well, First of all, I think a wonderful application, simple and straight to the point. But maybe let's have a closer look at the individual parts of the application and how they relate to the guidelines and maybe also some explorations how we could do that differently. Perfect. So the scarf case. Um, it's a very good example for a very targeted and simple application for maintenance workers. And it's a very good showcase for Fury. Um, I think what we, what we saw in that review is that there is really a very good use case and it's very well designed to the needs of the users. But I also found some possibilities for incremental improvements for the application. So let's go through that application quickly. Um, in the beginning we saw the work lists, uh, very simple and um, uh, targeted work lists uh, with direct access to the different work items and a very good overview of the priorities and the tasks that have to be done. What we see here is um, the team used um, letterboxing for the application. So you see the blue areas on the left and on the right, um, which can help to keep the application narrow and not to stretch too wide. This is, is especially important if you have applications that are targeted for an iPad or a phone but would not have enough content for a large desktop, for a desktop PC or a laptop. Um, I think in this case, maybe it's not really necessary. Instead, we could use also some padding left and right to the list. Um, what we also see is there is no title to the page. We have the header for the application, my work orders, but we don't have a title to the list, which also leaves us without toolbar, which we could use to add, um, for instance, the synchronization action to it. Um, there's also an address in the list, which maybe could be um, a link so that we can directly navigate to it. And we've also found some rendering issues with the chevrons that indicate that a line item can be navigated, which seems to be an issue with the version of UI5 the team was using in this case. Further. What I can always recommend is have a close look at the contents that you want to show and think about how you can better format it, how you can make it more readable and how you can emphasize parts that are important to the user. In this example, for instance, the priority. So high priority is something that calls attention, which could, for instance, use a red color to be highlighted. In newer versions of UI5, we can also offer a, uh, um, a border left to it to highlight a row. Uh, which is also very nice to use. So this is how it could look like as well. So I used the full width of the screen. I gave it a bit more uh, like padding left and right. And I added the table toolbar to it, which contains the information. These are work items and actions related to the application, to the table in this case, like the synchronization action, which was in the footer toolbar sorting, grouping, and other table settings so that the user can also uh, customize the table to his needs. This does not mean that on a, on a um, small device like a tablet or a phone, um, these borders, these paddings on the left and right would remain. They could, we have a responsive layout which reduces that padding when you're running on smaller devices. Um, further, we see an example for the formatting of, of the content. So high, medium and low. High would have a red, medium maybe an orange, a warning color. We have other um, status here. We have the type, start date. 
we have the address. This was something um, that I mentioned earlier. An address is always something that can bring uh, uh, support to a mobile use case by just clicking on it. It would call the mapping application of the device and give you routing instructions. Navigation food, uh, to, uh, Chevron looks like, like it should. And we see the sync action in the table toolbar. So this would be a straightforward work list as we have it in the guidelines, almost copied one to one. Now we see the work order details. So when I navigate from that initial li list into the work order details, I see an object page with some header facets and with an anchor bar with the different navigation targets. Um, I have the work address, the invoice address. I have some a large area for comments and a text area and I have the description and a text box as well. And I have the finaliz finalizing actions on the bottom where you can reschedule or change status. Where reschedule actually is no finalizing action nor is change status. So it's more a uh, an action that should um, should be um, on, on, the, on the header most likely. Um, <clears throat> so what we see here is um, the analysis that I did. So first of all, we see the object page being used without making use of the object page header title. The object page um, has an area on top, which is the header, which consists of two areas. One is the title on top, which always stays there, whereas the header content scrolls away. So in, in, when it's scrolled, you see um, like only the title. When it's scrolled down, you see the content as well. So the content scrolls up. Um, in this case, if I have every all the contents in the in the content area, there will be no header remaining, or it will just appear when you scroll it through because you can also put it into the title. But overall, what we recommend is always put the title really in the object header title so that it's stable up there, and um, put the content into the content. The title also offers you a toolbar, which will become handy um, to accommodate the actions that we see here, which are, as I said, most likely no finalizing actions, which should reside here because they are available for the whole page all the time, independent of the status. Um, we see the formatting of the header contents. Um, it's very, um, very small. There might be also possibilities to give a bit more expression to that. Um, you have the possibility to navigate here now on the work address. Um, I think the, the, the data that we see here is not really optimal. It's not a full address, so it's difficult to tell how it looks finally. Um, there is an icon to draw some more attention to it. Um, can also be helpful. There is an invoice address, which is obviously something that you usually would not navigate to, because um, why should I navigate to an invoice address? Um, so, um, but, but those two are maybe something that could, could also reside in the header content because um, actually they're taking a lot of space in the content area here. On the other hand, we have two elements which are really um, space consuming, like the customer comments and the description. And with the customer comments, we see that those are even still um, scroll scrollable or not fully visible so maybe there is also a better way to visualize them and uh, finalizing actions also here there are different aspects to that one is um, we should not use a, a negative color for reschedule i'm not quite sure why it's using this red color down here usually we use semantic colors for approve reject um, or things like that, but um, reschedule, if it's really per se a negative action, I don't know, and change status, um, yes, um, we come to that, I think. Further on, we don't combine icons and text, because um, if there is the text, if the icon is salient enough for a user to recognize it, I don't need the text. If I need the text, I don't need the icon, because both together are much more uh, information than needed in this case. So looking at the header, how it could look like. Um, so we see I took the object page header title to place the title in there, the title for the customer or for the farm, some ID information behind, for instance, and the reschedule action up here. If it's really something very negative or something, you can also make this a semantic 
colored uh, action, but I'm, as I said, I was not really convinced based on the use case that it should be red here. And then we have the content area, so we have a start date, end date, we have the status related information, priority, status, discount, arguable whether it's status or not, but somehow these are some pieces that could also go together. And then I put the different addresses up here. Um, I know this was work address, this was invoice address. I was just thinking maybe there is another address as well. So this could be placed here like work address, private address or something. And also the phone, maybe something that makes sense for that use case, because if that's a guy visiting customers on the road, maybe if he's late or if he's not finding the customer, maybe it would be good to have also access to the phone to call him and give them a heads up that he's late. With regards to the comments in the description, um, I'm wondering if maybe this information could sit next to each other because they seem to have a similar height. And um, as far as I understood, these comments should be editable, so we can keep them up and editable and they could be saved. If they're not editable, they would also be just text like this one. And if I have enough space, I can put them next to each other. If I have more less space, they go, go underneath of each other. What is clearly not a good solution is to place the text only in the full width, because um, we also know that a text that runs very long is very difficult to read, right? So that's why newspapers, for instance, have those columns, for instance, so that you have a, a narrow column which you follow down to read. And therefore, we try to restri restrict the width of a text always to as maximum the half of the screen, maybe even less if possible. So the, um, the object page, page actually has a four column layout um, originally. Um, we go down in the object page now to uh, attachments, time travel, checklist and so on. This is how it looks like. Um, there are um, different aspects to that. Here I can enter my time and my travel information. Here I can access checklists. Um, what I find here um, is something that um, I see often and I know why it's there, but I'm not sure that um, it's really the best way to, 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 to make the use of the space flexible. Uh, which is this collapsible container. So we, this is a panel basically, which has um, a flag which says it's collapsible. And then you have this little chevron where you can open or close it. But in fact, if you look at this closed container, this already uses quite some space, right? It's already quite some space that the container uses. And if you have to open it, it has to open up. It moves the whole screen along. And if I want to see information and just scan down a page, opening up uh, containers and closing them actually is quite some overhead just to make arrange the screen properly further you also have to think about if you use such collapsible states for different areas of the screen and i'm i can navigate multiple items like in this case work orders the expectation of the user actually is that the state persists from work order to work order so you will need to um, somehow find a way to store that state in the backend or in the working memory or somewhere so that um, this panel, the panels opened by the user remain open when navigating from work list to work list, which is also additional effort for implementation with an arguable outcome in the end. Um, yes. Um, alternatively, what we offer and what is um, also part of the guidelines that we have. Um, what you could do for time and travel, but also as we will see for the um, other parts for the checklists, is you could use grouping. So for instance, you have all time and travel items for today in a group. So it's a group header here, the list offers grouping, and you have them down here, one after the other. You have the possibility to add additional ones that would automatically become part of today. And if you really want to see more, you can use lazy loading, like load previous items, to, um, to expand the list. 
and then it would be kind of okay for the user if you navigate to the next work item that then only again only the, those for today are shown because those are anyhow those that are usually needed by the user so this would be a way how you avoid this collapsible containers and arranging containers over and over again um, one thing that I also found in the design is it's a simple text field uh, where I can enter a number. Um, we know when I do that on a mobile device, this means that a keyboard comes up and you have to find switch to the numbers. You have to enter a number or it's already automatically switched to numbers, also possible, but then you might need to also enter digits and so on. So the question is maybe um, why not just using a step input, which is a control that we offer um, as a standard control in Fiori where you can define increments along which the user can um, go up and this is a very easy way especially on touch devices to change such a, a value. Um, coming to the checklist area um, we see here um, this is the same pattern there are two collapsible containers um, with a list with checklists inside same issue usually the user only needs the assigned checklist so this is what he usually needs but he still has this permanently um, visible part on the screen which does not add value except for the case he really needs to all check to have all checklists so one option would be to just follow the same pattern as we saw it before and in addition maybe also make more use of the of the available screen because maybe there might be the need for the user to understand okay there is a difference between required checklists and not required checklists or he wants to see whether he has completed a checklist already or whether he has this one still open whether it's he has started it and he needs to complete it still so this kind of information could also go in there to make use of that super long space that we have here we see he is required he is completed but as long as there is no information obviously and it remains empty um, it looks kind of really very empty um, so even if there is no information may uh, no, if it's not required maybe also give some feedback um, that it's not required for instance and again use semantic colors use icons use text make it expressive make it easy to to follow um, an, another option that you could also think about is you just show the checklists that are um, needed or assigned. You don't need a grouping but you just have the list of all checklists assigned and you offer an action where you can look up additional checklists and you add them here. So you have a dialog which shows you all the checklists, you select the one you want to add and it's being added to that list of checklists. Would be an option as well maybe even more appropriate for that case but again it's always up to how people use such an application which needs to be explored um, ideally together with those users the checklist itself um, is a form so we see it's a full page with um, a list based form so every form element is actually a form and uh, a list entry it uses uh, the vertical layout now of the of the form with um, the, the label on top and the element below and for every item that can be answered a new line into the list is added and we have the com complete action down here um, there are some things to to consider here um, first of all i think having different lengths between the the different input elements might be a bit confusing it's also thinking about it like it's not really it doesn't look as ordered as it could if it were, had all the same length also we will never be able to use the full width of the, of the of the screen here so the question is is it really the best option to put it on a full screen or maybe there's another way how we can uh, can contain the content a bit more um, the rendering of, of the form elements in a list um, is something that we have also as a standard feature in Fiori and we see it in some mobile um, platforms as well but we see also other mobile platforms that went away from it um, because actually the readability and the, the way to, to, to pass that information is not really optimal 
it has about a part of different pieces and it, when creating an information architecture in that form we see it here for instance this is also not really very supportive to have such a list so maybe just using a regular form and we have smart forms for instance where we can just push the data and it renders the form automatically would be an option that might be more readable as well we see also that the way how the mandatory fields are indicated is not using the standard how mandatory fields are indicated um, well and the final action is only complete um, assuming that a user started working on a, on a checklist and maybe there are some mandatory fields he has to fill in oh sorry um, some mandatory fields that he has to fill in um, he might not be able to complete anymore. He will na have to navigate out or something. So therefore, whenever there is a, an intermediate state of a, of a, of a page or a dialogue or something um, that I might want to abort, there needs to be a, a, a confirmative action and a, a, an abortion action, meaning cancel, for instance. So what is missing here is cancel in addition to complete. Or for instance, save, save for later, something like that. So an example how this could look like is um, maybe we could really just put the checklist in a dialogue because there is not so much space needed. And that would also help us with aligning the content elements, um, putting them all underneath of each other, maybe using a smart form, for instance, um, and having a final action like complete, save, meaning you don't complete it yet, it's still work in progress, but I have to stop working on it for now, or cancel, which means throw away everything, which would require, of course, a confirmation still. And this is an example how that list, list could look like as well, um, where you have even more uh, differentiation between, or, or give more information, more um, affordance on what is really happening here, because somehow it's not just navigating to a checklist is actually working on a checklist and if it's a, a dialogue the navigation chevron also does not work that well so in this case i would recommend maybe using actions so you put an action um, column in here um, where you could for instance open again which means this one i have started working on but i no, i have completed already so this one was completed but i can open it again and change it still or I have um, things that I have started but not finished, which I want to open really. Could be a way to handle this checklist as well, alternative to the previous one. Um, here we see now um, there's a possibility to record the material that was used um, in, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a service order. So uh, we have some information where you can call the details of the, the material, the material ID. I think there's also the possibility to scan the, the, the material and you have this information and then you can, can add some additional information like how many, um, whether you want to give a discount on it and so on. But in the end it's really discount and the amount that can be modified by that user here. What we find here is um, this page does not have a title. So it's to me not 100% sure whether it's an object page or whether it's a plain page with panels but usually we try to put a title on top of the page just to give the user really an understanding what that thing is about um, yeah, it seems to be an object page but I'm actually not quite sure um, the form we see this is the label this is the text um, this is I, I come to that later but Overall, in Fiori, we are using a uh, left-aligned label with a, uh, a right-aligned label with a left-aligned content, which brings both as close together as possible, especially in a setup like this one. We see how difficult it can be to relate order number to the number itself, material number with the number itself, because there's a huge gap in between, which results in a left-aligned label, which is nevertheless standard in many applications but we see the implication of what this has um, the step input of course is something that would make sense here and the uh, actions actually the scan is to get this information here so my recommendation would to put would be to put it here 
save just the same as before save and cancel should be an option here as well um, this is an example of the label alignment so what we see here traditionally um, we have uh, the, um, the label aligned left and the content aligned left this is okay if you have a fixed layout so, which means you can determine whether the distance between the label and the content gets bigger or smaller because you, you have a fixed layout, so you say it's always this distance and then you can relate it to. So this is still somewhat okay, but not really good. Um, what we have in business applications, first of all, the, num the, the length of the labels for us is really hard to determine. So customers can change that label. When translation happens, um, labels can become really long. There are languages that can triple or even make the length of a label four times or more. Um, and of course, when running on different devices um, or in a browser with different window sizes and, and, and so on, we cannot determine the, 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 the gap between those two. So it can be huge, it can be small. And um, if it becomes huge, as we just saw it, it really becomes hard to relate the two. Therefore, um, and this is also based on research and there are multiple studies, nevertheless, it's always in a matter of discussion, um, we decided to align the labels left, uh, right. So which means in the end, you have a scanning line. The user has a scanning line in the center. If you go down this line, you can read the label and the text at just at the same time. So it's really easy for the user to process. No problem to relate the two. And if the label gets longer, it just grows into that direction. Of course, downside, and this is something why many people prefer this one, this one looks less ordered, especially if you have different lengths. It gets a bit messy. You get this Christmas tree kind of layout. Um, but usability, in our, in our minds, usability rules um, aesthetics here and we want to make sure that people really know what that number means and that they don't have to guess it based on a word that is um, far apart on the left. Um, toolbars and icons. Um, here we see the example with a scan and save. Um, this is how it's uh, done in the application. This is how it would be in the, in the, um, in a, in, in the standard. So we would say save and cancelled. Save could be an emphasized button, so with a blue background. Of course, we need a cancel because in, I might just have misscanned it or I have discarded it or whatever. So save and cancel. And the scan, I would think maybe it makes sense to put it next to the, um, to the input field. Maybe even to be more expressive, really use the text scan new material because you might already have a material in here um, but um, you want to scan a new one so you enter this one so this is um, it's just clearer and in terms of training usually when people have a clear label they need more, less training that was already it i think uh, overall what we saw um, there was not so much things to complain about it's very simple and intuitive application i said very much to the point um, the thing that that was um, maybe most interesting is really the explorations on the layout how to use the content and um, i think especially this travel times and checklists how they can be treated um, was something which you see, there are different options. You cannot really tell upfront which one is the right one, which is the wrong one. The only thing that helps is really to test it with your end users, doing a mock-up, trying it out. It's an easy thing to do using build, using Axure, whatever you need, and just get the feedback and go along that way. Don't fix yourself too early to a certain design. Keep your mind open and just try out what works best. Yeah, with that, thanks for now. <laughs> Thanks, Kai. Thanks a lot for this great presentation. I think everybody learned a lot from this showcase and how the Fiori guidelines can make the experience even better for the end users. So this was the Fiori Makers showcase from 2BM. And I hope you liked it. Please leave your feedback and comments on our Fiori Makers blog. This was it from our side. Thanks for being a Fiori Maker.